want to introduce Mac O'Sullivan. Mac is the head of youth football in AIK Sweden. Uh, he's currently doing a PhD in nonlinear pedagogy, and he is also a consultant to the Canadian FA. And most importantly, he's from Cork. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. We should be all to Shalga Gallup, a mass of we know in Lombarda. So said the wonderful Terry Poet, Martino de Roin, in his poem Sista. It's about being uprooted. 23 years ago, I uprooted myself, moved to Stockholm, Sweden. And in the Martin de Roin poem, he speaks about the mass of Wiener, among my people. And here I am, back in my hometown, among my people, among some people who have absolutely inspired me in my work and continue to inspire me. They're here today and I'm eternally grateful for them. But also an absolute honour to be asked to speak at this event. I was saying to somebody earlier, I feel like uh, the non-league team that had a long run in the FA Cup. <laughs> so I feel like being here. So um, I work in AIK in Sweden. Um, we had a premiere last week, 31,000 attended the game. Good start. Team won 2 0. Wasn't the best game. There was lots of uh, Bengal fire things and everything and all the usual stuff. Um, through Sheffield Hallam University, under the guidance of Pete Davis, I'm doing a PhD in designing learning environments for children. And uh, I've been working the last year uh, with the Canadian FA, consulting them and helping them develop. Um, training programs for coaching child youth sports, coach education. Um, also, I face the beauty of film. Anyone face the beauty of film? Okay. Um, as many as possible, as long as possible, as good as possible, possible, as many children as possible, coming to the sport, playing for as long as possible, to become as good as possible. A very important statement in Sweden. A statement that guides much of our work. Today I'll talk about that there are a few areas of sport that's complex yet embedded in an issue of child youth football. Talk about designing learning environments for as many as possible, as long as possible, as good as possible. Affordances and a term we use in our club, football interactions. And speak a bit about the learner, the learning process, captured in the theoretical framework of ecological dynamics. So I'm trying to get crush that all in in a half hour talk. And you'll see some films as well. Um, this week we had a camp at a, a club AIK, kids 7 to 12. The whole camp, all week, was designed on principles of nonlinear pedagogy. So, what's happening in Sweden? What's going on? Page one, coach education. Level one, the C diploma. Children and young people who devote themselves heart and soul to football deserve responsible and knowledgeable leaders. We have high goals, a children's rights perspective, and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child are the basis and wording for our curriculum. How high do you think that sets the level? How high? Lower high? Pretty damn high, I can tell you. Page one. The club AIK, a traditional Swedish club over 120 years old, used to have um, a selection policy from eight, an academy, beginning at eight. Two years ago, asked the question, is it possible to structure the club in a way that is even more consistent with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, relevant governing documents, and implement them in a child and youth sport in a better way than how it is done today? Can the structure match the kids, not the kids matching the structure? April 2008, a decision was taken. There will be no selection of eight-year-olds. Selection will begin around 13. But there will be certain criteria and ideas. I will, can't go into it about that, how it will be done. No early selection. Removed it. Other clubs, I can't name them, big clubs, are going to follow pretty soon. Following the United Nations Charter Rights of Children and, go and relative governing documents. I'll come to the governing documents in a minute. Vision is to be the leading club in the Nordic region for the development and fostering of young players and leaders, no matter how you measure it. 
And part of our work now is we've struck up a collaboration with uh, FC Barcelona's methodology department with uh, Joan uh, Vila and Maurizzi. And we spoke at um, an event in October at the Camp Nou about uh, ecological theory of nonlinear practice and creative collab collaboration in AK football. They will now come to us in May and we will continue this work and start building a collaboration of research around both this ARC, the AK form of life that is emerging and the Barcelona form of life. However, as many as possible, as long as possible, as good as possible, it all sounds wonderful, it sounds fantastic, it sounds great. There are a few areas of sport that are as complex yet embedded in, in inertia as child youth football. I've picked a Swedish research here. I've translated this from some Swedish view. An issue, Rolf Carlson in 1991, with a sort of ecological elegance said, that talent is an issue of the interaction of the individual with the environment. What circumstances are offered to learn different skills, social roles, and the individual's readiness for this? It is more important to seek ways to find the time needed to develop a talent instead of trying to find finished talent. Then in 2017, this research paper was done using 15 top coaches in Sweden working at youth level at district and national team level, 15, 16, 17 year olds. Coaches' talent identification is guided by what feels right in the heart and stomach. But what feels right is greatly influenced by their experience of previous identifications, interpretations of what league football entails and the coaching culture in which they find themselves. What feels right in the heart and stomach? Is that how we will talent ID our children? And there is a so I, what I've done is I've gone through 25 years of governing documents, strategy documents, as many as possible, as long as possible, as good as possible. We base everything on the United Nations Charter of Rights of Children. And I found that there's a discrepancy between federal governing documents, strategies, child youth sport, and the scientific communities of practice of sport. P.G. Falstrom, a brilliant researcher from Sweden, particularly in ice hockey, has spoken speaks about ge ge uh, generic linear talent, model, talent models are still being promoted despite the fact young athletes develop at different rates. We need generic models to try and find unique people. Cultures, they are permissive or restrictive in, in different ways. And clubs and associations still anchored in the traditional view of sport and competition. We go out into the, we look at the research outside of Sweden that's been done. And even though the literature is generally more humanistic, there seems to be a continuous emergence of non-linear flexible pro programs promoting early talent ID specialization. Structured performance pathways now common across the world. Many countries investing heavily in uh, talent development. Environments often co um, characterized by linear technique programs that ignore the detection of useful contextual information. So there we have it, the Swedish research. The strategy documents are saying one thing. We're looking at the international research. And then at AIK, this is really important. We go down to the micro. Every year, every team in our club, we have 1,800 players. Every team in our club has to fill in a year plan. What they're going to do, how they're going to work. And I'll tell you, this is a big wake-up call. In Swedish we say lika born leke best, which basically means children with the same ability play best together. And, adult, and this is, by the way, the, I'm only taking this from, from um, parents and coaches involved in teams of eight and nine year olds. This is an adult creative concept. One, many teams suggested that they use a warning system to ensure order. Players that are just drifting, have no engagement, low focus, yellow card, continue to get a red card. Typical argument would be, would you focus, why would you focus on calculus without first teaching the foundation in math? Using these comments to explain why we must teach young players the foundation technique through repetition and correction with the aim of reducing variability. The 10,000 hours comes up. My, Malcolm Gladwell has an awful lot to answer for because the amount of parents in Sweden that have read his book is uh, pretty unbelievable. The race to the bottom, 10,000 hours. We must practice, 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 practice. We must start early, get the kids in early. Parents have bought this. 
socioeconomic. This is a quote. I didn't send my son to a training camp in Sweden just so he can play with some of the players of his team who are clearly not that good. Her son is eight. Children are not nearly adults. There we have it. Despite the good intentions, despite all how AIK wants to work, despite how the football associations are backing us, how we want to do, we have these cultural resilient beliefs that we are facing every, every single day, and we're working. And I'll go into tell you how we'll start to work with it. So basically, I suppose you've heard that saying that culture is strategy for breakfast, well also bad culture is strategy for breakfast. We can have the best strategies, the best ideas, fantastic, as many as possible, as long as possible, as good as possible, child's perspective, holistic approach. These are all in strategy documents. They're what? There is no how. Our day-to-day -day practice design pedagogy, understanding of the learner and the learning process in child youth football has been shaped by a form of life that has emerged over decades in our communities and society. So, we're back to as many as possible, as long as possible, as good as possible. Now this is where my PhD work comes in. This is kind of a basis. How do we design learning environments for as many as possible, as long as possible, as good as possible? How? It would not be achieved only at task level, but also at the levels of society and culture. Acceptance of individual differences among learners, very important. Understanding the consequences of the social and cultural landscape that has emerged in recent decades and influenced the structure of the practice and practice in child youth football. Um, maybe some of you follow my blog. I sort of did a blog on a club in England that was having trials for five year olds. And on the poster, the parents had to fill in what position their child played. And I wrote to them and said, My son's favourite position is in the middle of a road in Lego. <laughs> I think it's quite a valid point, to be honest. It was for my son. He's five. So, AIK, we've started now Scandinavia's first research and development department in football. Uh, James Vaughan, myself, and a guy called Dennis Portian. Um, James Vaughan is also doing a PhD. Um, and we're ideas around navigating all this complexity now that, I, that, that I've mentioned, this, this form of life that has emerged over decades that is still influencing children, coaches, parents' perspectives, etc. Humans are not systems that behave like machines. The game is a continuum of complexity, Pacus Irulu. The game is complex. It's a continuum. Christ said the game is simple. Yes, it is simple. If you score more goals than the opposition, you win the game. That is what he meant. The game is complex. It's a continuum of complexity. The culture is complex. There is need to be addressed. International Olympic Committee statement on youth development. Um, 2014, I think it came out. Correct me if I'm wrong, 2016. They did a meta-analysis of all the research in child youth sport. Basically, one of the major uh, outcomes in this research is that child youth sport is become too media centered, too sensationalized, far too, ra far too influenced by adults, that in some way it needs to go back to the children. Learning, yeah, com it's complex. If you step into the learning process, you better, need, you, you better add value. I, was get, I, I do some coach education courses in the Swedish FA as well. Um, I do um, a couple, one or two every month. Uh, two years ago, I was, we had a break, looked out the window, a bunch of seven-year-olds come running onto the pitch with a load of football. It's not playing. There's a 2v2 going there, there's a 3v3 there, there's a 2v1 over there. It's a Champions League. They're giving it everything. The coaches turn up. Whistles, cones, ladders. What do you think they did, the coaches? First thing. Get everyone together, and then they start in the session. Session could have been good, but did they add value to what was already happening? What the children decided for themselves that they wanted to do. What could, they, what could, what could the coach have done? What? Well, 
watching and yeah, maybe make like a change, go in and challenge the kids in some way. So our vision, our values, our practice, and our research needs to be grounded in a theoretical framework. This is important because now I only found this out today. We've actually got AIK, we've got money from the uh, national governing body, I suppose, in Sweden to actually do this. We're going to do an analysis of our form of life under a theoretical framework, an ecological theoretical framework. Because as I said, there's lots of strategies, fantastic strategy documents. They're absolutely out there in Swedish. They're absolutely outstanding to read. Amazing work. That's the what. There is no theoretical framework for implementation. We, we're suggesting we ground, uh, uh, research needs to be grounded in a theoretical framework that accounts for human development at sociocultural, macro form of life levels and form the acquisition of growth and skill in micro environments. Ground player development, therefore learning in a broader ecological context. It needs to be grounded in player development, needs to be grounded, especially in child youth football, in a broader ecological context. Because I'll tell you, there is stuff on the outside that is coming in consistently, consistently. So, this is basically uh, adapted from the athlete talent development environment. It's kind of how we're conceptualizing the club and the environment and the kids. We have the research and development academy, AIK school, family, macro, micro environment. And I love this quote from Joan Vila, head of methodology at FC Barcelona. The coach needs to understand the game, but also other aspects that surround the game. The surrounding environment, society, culture, and economy. We sat with uh, Joan Vila for a couple of hours in October when we were there. She said an amazing thing. She says, we have an academy for one reason, to keep our form of life going. To keep how we live going on the football pitch. That's the only reason why we exist. Quite an interesting approach from him. So challenging culture resiliently, there's that triangle again. That's a, I think of Toblerone when I see it, but that's just me. <laughs> so in, getting back again to that Rolf Carlson's definition of, the, of um, talent, you also think about potential, it should be viewed to it. To, as a viewed as a dynamic and continuously open to ongoing influences passing into the individual environment. This holistic understanding allows coaches to appreciate and negotiate these interacting elements that effectively shape the landscape they provide for their learners. Um, somebody actually, it was a good question by Nick about constraints that approach, and actually this is what I thought, what is it? And it's, for me, implementing it requires a deep understanding of sport and skill learning, Yourself, the individual, the social, cultural, and psychological person, and the environment, how we design training and the macro form of life, the social and political lands landscape. These underpin and inform nonlinear pedagogy. So, we're kind of getting into here now the practical. So, I've given you kind of a picture of AIK, the cultural and resilient beliefs in Sweden. These cultural resilient beliefs, are, I'm quite sure they're the same in Ireland, they're the same in England, they're the same in Northern Ireland, did I miss any Finland? I'm quite sure they're, they're quite similar. I, 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 I was in Canada recently, gave a talk, did some practice, spoke with coaches. Very similar, extremely very similar problems with par parent problems, positive, negative coaches, ideas, education the macro environment, the expectations, performance anxiety of players who are selected early. It's all, it's quite, it, it's it becoming a common theme as I travel, when I, when I meet people. Um, we had a camp this week, you're gonna see some films in a minute from it, and we based it on these principles. We want to develop players with a better understanding in the game, not of the game. In the game, so on a half of the game, you work at half time with Sky Sports and you analyze the game. We want to develop better understanding in the game. Ideas around representative learning design, what the players are seeing as feeling is representative of the game. 
Repetition without repetition, movement variability. Key perception action coupled. A promotion of an external focus of attention. We are promoting it in our design, getting the children, I'm speaking about young kids now, to look for information to exploit, look for possibilities for action, forward and keep following what you want. This is uh, my good friend Mark Upton, Rethinking Training Design. I quite like this. It's a very simple tool, for, particularly for parent coaches, to give them a, a better understanding of where we're going. You see there, we have many repetitions, few repetitions, less game-like, more game-like. We're looking more for many repetitions, but more game-like. Here on the left top, we have repetition with repetition. On the top right, repetition without repetition. We're kind of pushing it in that way. We're trying to get coaches to start designing environments on that side. Um, I think it's a film now, is it? Just, yeah, just one sec. So, before you press it, um, I was asked this in Canada, Mark, you know, if I don't teach a kid how to use his left foot, his right foot, the inside and the outside of the foot. So I said, what do you mean? He says, oh, look, what? And get some kids and it's just, and they're all driven around the ball and he's shouting, inside, outside, left foot, right foot, inside or right, outside or right. And go, Okay. So what I did, I, what I did is the second part of this film. So on, let's play. So this is quite a classic approach. Please. I think I've referred to it on Twitter as cone porn. <laughs> I'm from Cork. I can say what I want now. <laughs> So, my solution to the inside, outside, left foot, right foot, was we have a game of tag. With no instructions. And there we have kids using right foot, left foot, inside, outside. Here we are. Taking in a focus, externally, looking for information. If you want to survive in this environment, you've got to do certain things. Implicitly. I actually showed the film to one of the kids, and he said, I'm not left footed. So, is what the players in the tag game seem representative of the game? I asked the kids this question. These are seven-year-olds, by the way. Seven years of age. You'll see more seven and eight-year-olds in a minute. It's representative in what way, Adam? Oh, uh, uh, I'm being chased by something. Oh, that's good. Good. What do you do then? Oh, we have to run away. Where? Do you run over the other side of the... No, space. They know this thing themselves. They've already done it. They know it. Oh, good. Repetition without repetition? Movement variability in this? Yeah? What do you reckon? Yeah? Yeah? No? Thank you. Perception action coupled? Yeah? External focus? And this one in affordances is the primary object of perceptions. Football interactions are how players utilize affordances. Football interactions is the base for all our training in the club. A football interaction is very simple. It's dribbling, passing, shooting, off the ball running. The reason why we use the word interaction is because the word action, for some reason, still drops the coach back to what they're comfortable with. The biomechanical action of, yeah, you have to do this foot here like this, you have to do this like this, like this, and then do this. So we're trying to get change. Maybe you want to change the culture, you need to change the language. So we're saying football interaction. Your pass, your shot, your dribbling, your movement, it's interacting with the environment and it's changing, it's consistently dynamic, you're influencing it. Yes, so it's an interaction, a football interaction. So here we have football interaction, and, and this is quite an interesting one, football interaction. I, I like working with, with coaches saying this, 
they're dependent on circumstances. Now, historical, historical in the sense that we have two eight-year-olds. One lives in the bottom floor, the other lives in the top floor, 10th floor. His, uh, on the 10th floor, single mother works all day, grandmother at home looking after. Kid in the bottom floor, eight years of age, out with his older brothers during the day, kicking a ball around. Both love football, both turn up the first day at the club. Thankfully, it's not a trial because we don't have trials anymore. Both turn up. Which one is a talent? We ignore, without any knowledge of the... Pr These two kids arrive with a whole bibliography of experience, of opportunities and possibilities for movement. Two of them. And very often, they're getting judged without us understanding their history. We could be moved. There could be, there's potential. We don't know, but we're making decisions. So, design the task assimilates an aspect of form design. Practice design should highlight informational constraints to improve coupling of perception, action, and players, and promote through football interactions the utilization of relevant affordances, affordances and possibilities for action in the environment. And it's a very good way of explaining it is that you have a gap between two players. Lionel Messi will do what? What will he do? No, it's a gap. He's at, yeah. Well, he, yeah, 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 yeah. Lionel Messi with a cold, <laughs> he'll just dribble through. Xavi, when he has a, is that a gap, what does he do? Passes through to non coming forward. Learning design, boundaries, size, shape of pitch, scoring, shape, size, orientation of goals, players, number allocation, start position of players, start position of the ball. You can try it any, anywhere. Point scoring systems, additional rules and regulations. So this is what we gave to the kit. I gave this to the coaches um, at the start of the camp. And so, aim of training design is to help players learn how to utilize affordances using football interactions, both in possession of ball and in recovery of ball. They were challenged to design a session where time and space are foundational variables. In possession, identify, create, exploit, occupy, use space. That's how we define possession. We have the ball, we're identifying, we're creating, we're exploiting, occupy or using space, using football interactions. Key concepts in design, gaps, pockets, space behind, space in front. Space in depth. Let me say max eight players design session based on principles of non union pedagogy. I'm going to show you a video I did with the Swedish national goalkeeping coach. It's totally based on this. Can we press play, please? 3v3, one goalkeeper, one resting keeper who kicks the ball behind. This time. Mats Altendahl is, uh, I think it's his youth national team. 16. Is it representative of the game? Repetition without repetition, yeah. Hmm? Very simple game. I've done this with eight-year-olds as well. They love it. They love the fact that the ball is thrown behind them and let them run back to the keeper. It's, they love it. So, I'm coming into the case study of uh, where I do my work. Um, this film is, I was up late last night editing this, this is from the camp. Some important things, the challenges as well as this is from the coaches, the questions I said to the coaches are, you have in your design, it's very important that you, that you help the players answer the following questions in your design, the players are given the opportunity to answer these questions. Young kids, seven, eight years of age, one thing I think <laughs> is that 
you're wondering why you, know, you need to create width, you need to create depth. That's the ball. I want the ball. What are you on about? They're attracted to the ball. You have to give value to it. You have to give, if you're looking for this behavior to emerge, you have to give value first to this. So we say, I get the challenge from coaches. Is it harder or easier to defend a big stake? It's harder to defend a big stake. What does this mean for the team in possession? Try this with seven and eight rules. You'll be very, very surprised as they play the game how they, how they work this out. That's one. Second question, what are gaps? Third question, how do we exploit these gaps? The whole week is only based on this. So here we have, we just start with simple tag games. These kids are born 2010, all of them. Different abilities, different needs. Some of them have, special, have needs. Some have played a year, some have played three years, maybe, I don't know. It's chaos. <laughs> it's a good way to start a cold, soccer morning, I can tell you. So then, another one, give them all bests. You, you, you try and take the player's best. It's everyone against everyone. Left foot, right foot, inside, outside, no coach telling them what to do. Yeah. The, the only thing is that the bit which they take the ball, the battery's in my phone, right? So that's not there, so. I have to go and recharge it. So there we are. So you can also say you take the best and the ball. And a competition also, we'd loads of bests on the side. When you lost your best, you go over and take another best. The player with the most bests in their hand wins. One v one, two one v ones going at the same time. One v ones do not happen in a vacuum. Two going at the same time makes it, in my, in my opinion, a little bit more representative. Then you can break into a two v two with the exact same space. Here we have a two v two. Another 2v2 in the exact same space that the two 1v1s going for. Now, this, where have we seen this? I think in cold or coaching, that could be called a chop back or something. <laughs> Sorry. Looks familiar? Found a gap. Identified a gap. He decided to pass it through the gap. It's his decision. This. Where have we seen this before? behavior, maybe?
notice how he moved out there, they moved out? They wanted to make it harder for the opposition to get the ball because Harry could defend the big space. This is a small pedagogical game where you use two jokers, one on either side, 2v2 in the middle, maybe with a joker. Just play ball from one joker to the other, you get a point. On the gap. that he couldn't go forward so went back. Found the gap. By this stage, the kids understand what a gap is. They've informed us after playing the game. It's between two players that begin clearing the sideline, and I can dribble, shoot, or pass. They've just worked this out themselves in the game. Making the pitch harder to defend. Giving value to moving away from the ball. Giving value to moving away from the ball. So, what was it? We speak to parents. Sometimes your parents turn up and they look at this and go, he's playing football. Yeah, <laughs> but there's a pedagogy behind it. So what we've done at this camp is every evening I went home, took film, made a small film, wrote the training design, what we did, explained why we're doing it in simple terms of theory, ideas, even mentioned bits about nonlinear pedagogy, Explain it to them. Suddenly, there's a, things are happening. I was just now getting, we're getting feedback emails going, oh, now I get this. Just a little thing like that, an email home. Got an email today, said, yeah, do you know what, me, me and my son, we couldn't wait to get the videos at the end of the night, we'd watch them. So I send a video, so you have a parent sitting with their seven, eight year old, and he's and telling me about gaps and about this. So that's, Um, I'm not correcting because these are seven and eight year olds. The correction would come in the game design. Okay, gaps, what are they? Oh, they're just, I'm walking, yeah, you can pass through them. So, how, so how do you stop that now? So that's the, the next challenge. Oh, so that's another challenge to reverse it. I don't particularly like, these are certainly talking too much about defending, but maybe giving them the concept and idea of that, hmm, I must close a gap as well. You understand what I mean? That it's, again, it's from how they perceive the environment, how they perceive what's happening, the information, that they themselves go, oh, we need to close this gap. It's, it's a communication, but first feedback comes from the game to the child. Don't shoot the learner, let them work it out, let them fail, let them fail better. <coughs> Guide them, nudge them. It will happen, there's no hurry. But the thing is, I, I believe that getting young learners to, to um, perceive the information, the opportunity to act in accordance with, to work on them, to act on them using football interactions themselves. And you just guide it and nudge it. Correction? No. I wouldn't go in and correct. I might go in and say, how does it, how does it look now? And then suddenly you think, you know, maybe that, but not really correcting. Hmm? So, I think that's everything for me. <laughs> Thank you.